kind of impulse that if we were to cut the assistance at this point, the kind of impulse it would create among the military to sort of demonstrate the cost to us of having done that. Uh, and I worry about what its implications would be for that treaty. I worry about what its implications would be for the behavior in the Sinai, notwithstanding the fact that from the... From Louisiana. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to end the quorum call. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to propose and support two amendments to the appropriation bill that is on the floor today and will continue into next week. And they both have a common theme, and that theme is to keep faith with the American people, to not put ourselves here in Washington, here in Congress, in a different higher class than middle-class Americans, but to be one of them, to truly represent them, to truly fight for them here in Washington. The two amendments address this in different ways. One is to block a pay raise that would otherwise happen for members of Congress, even in the midst of this very, very sluggish economy, barely getting out of the recent recession. And Mr. President, as you know, there is an automatic pay raise in the law. This was done years ago, really behind closed doors in a bit of a smoke-filled room to put an automatic pay raise for members of Congress in the law so that most every year it just happens automatically. No inconvenience of having to propose it, actually having to come to the Senate floor, come to the floor of the House of Representatives and justify it and, God forbid, have to vote for it. It just happens. I disagree strongly with that system. I think that entire system and premise is offensive. And for that reason, Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri and I have a bill, a proposal to undo that and require that any future pay raise have to be proposed, justified on the floor of the Senate and the floor of the House and actually voted on. This amendment is not that entire bill. This amendment is focused on the here and now to block the automatic pay raise that would happen this year if we don't act. Now, uh, you will hear from members of the committee, handlers of this appropriation bill, well, this amendment isn't relative, isn't germane to this bill. Well, uh, the folks who set up the automatic pay raise system several years ago were very clever. They figured out a way that an amendment like this would not be germane to any appropriation bill, would not be germane to any bill. That's why we need to act on this bill, because this may be one of the few appropriation bills, few spending bills we actually deal with on the floor of the Senate this year. To Congress's credit, in the midst of the recent recession, Congress denied itself these automatic pay raises. And so they have not happened since 2009. But, Mr. President, we're not into healthy growth. The American middle class, Mr. President, is not doing just fine. Unemployment is still over 7.5%, 7.6%, well above the 5% promised when Congress and President Obama passed the trillion dollar stimulus. In fact, we've had 53 straight months with unemployment above 7.5%. That is not a healthy economy. That is not recovery. And so as Americans continue to suffer, continue to look for work, continue to look for full-time work as part-time becomes more the norm, particularly in the era of Obamacare, we need to relate to them and not set ourselves apart. We need to be a fighter for them, not a member of a higher, different class in Washington. And one simple but important way to do that is to say, no pay raise when we're in the midst of this very, very sluggish non-recovery. Again, Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri has joined me in this effort. I appreciate her partnership on the broader bill, and I appreciate her partnership on this amendment, the Vitter Amendment number 1746. And I urge all of my colleagues, Democrats as well as Republicans, to adopt and support this common sense amendment. This is an important message. This is an important statement. 
And the question and the choice is simple. Are you going to be a true representative of the folks back home, relate to them, be one of them? Or did you really come to Washington to put yourself in a different, higher class? The answer needs to be the first answer provided. We need to represent the folks back home, not put ourselves in a different, higher class. And this pay raise amendment is one way to do that. Say no to any congressional pay raise in the midst of this horribly slow economy. And Mr. President, my second amendment also continues this theme, and it relates to our health care benefits. But it's really the same issue and the same theme. Are we one with the folks we were elected to represent, or are we trying to set ourselves as a different, higher class here in Washington? This amendment is Vitter Amendment Number 1748, and it would ensure that all members of Congress, all congressional staff, all executive appointees deal with Obamacare in the same way ordinary Americans do. They have to go in the exchange. They have to deal with their health care that way. They don't get special treatment. Now, in the midst of the Obamacare debate, that issue came up. I brought the issue up. I brought an amendment to the floor. My Louisiana colleague in the House, John Fleming, did the same thing in the House. Because of the attention we focused on that issue, there was a limited provision in the law that said members of Congress and their direct staffs would be in the exchanges. However, very conveniently, some of the details were jiggered around so that members of the leadership and their staffs and committee staffs would somehow be in a different, higher category, and they would not be subject to the same Obamacare rules. They would benefit from the very generous and very lucrative federal employee health benefit plan that Congress has traditionally been under. I think we should undo that. I think we should again be one of the American people, relate to the American people, and get the same treatment through the exchanges that the great majority of them will do under Obamacare. Problem is, here on Capitol Hill, again, behind closed doors, the effort is largely in the opposite direction. Wall Street Journal unveiled this on April 25th of this year. It reported that Senator Reid and Congressman Steny Hoyer had initiated some behind closed doors secret discussions to actually fix the problem as they saw it and put all members of Congress and all of our staffs back in that select category, not with the American people, not in the exchanges, but in that select higher category and be granted preferential treatment. Now, because that uh, hit the press, because that word got out, I am hopeful that those secret negotiations have stopped. We need to make sure that we don't move in that direction. Obamacare is a train wreck. Implementation is causing dramatic problems for millions upon millions of Americans. But the solution is, is not to fix it selectively for us. <laughs> the solution is to fix it for everybody, to fix it for average middle class Americans. And if we do that, we would benefit as well. And so this amendment not only blocks the effort by Senator Reid and Steny Hoyer and others to move members of Congress and our staffs back into a select category and protect us from the train wreck of Obamacare implementation, the solution is to broaden that pool and actually have that same treatment along with ordinary Americans for every member of Congress, for all of our staffs, for leadership, for committee staffs, and also for President Obama's appointees. And so my amendment, Vitter Amendment Number 1748, on which Dean Heller is a co-sponsor, would do just that. It would ensure that all bureaucrats, all Obama appointees, all congressional staff, all members, leadership and otherwise, 
all of our staffs, committee and otherwise, are subject to Obamacare and are not put into a select higher class and offered preferential treatment. Again, common theme with my other amendment, that's how we relate to the folks we represent. That's how we're truly one of them. Obamacare is a problem. Implementation is a train wreck. But the solution isn't to put ourselves in a higher class divorced from that problem. The solution is to live that problem ourselves. And hopefully that will promote us and motivate us to solve that problem for all of the American people. Again, this is not a partisan amendment. This should not be a partisan fight. This is about are we truly part of the states we represent? Do we truly relate to those citizens who sent us to Washington? Or do we come here and put ourselves in a select different class, give ourselves preferential treatment under law after law after law, in this case, Obamacare? Again, this is Vitter Amendment number 1748, and I urge all of my colleagues, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, everyone, to support this, to tell your constituents. No, I didn't come here to put myself in a special class. I didn't come here to get preferential treatment. I came here to fight for you. And yes, Obamacare has major issues, major problems. Implementation is as one of my Democratic colleagues has forthrightly said, a train wreck. But the solution isn't to fix it behind closed doors selectively for us. The solution is to fix it, which I mean, which personally I think means delay or repeal it for the American people. Thank you, Mr. President. And I yield back the floor. I also suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Who would like to address that? <clears throat> I, I, think, Ross. I think the key point, I think, to understand is they represent an important social force within Egypt. So if you exclude what is an impos important social force within Egypt, then you're, this is basically a prescription for trouble because there's going to be, they're going to express themselves some way. What we have right now is a reaction to the ouster of President Morsi. Uh, the question is whether or not there can be some vehicle for bringing the, uh, those who are part of the Muslim Brotherhood back into the political process. What I was saying in my testimony is they should not be excluded. If they choose to take themselves out of the equation, that's one thing, but they should not be excluded. And I don't believe it's going to be easy to bring them back into it, it right now, simply because I think they're so determined to make a statement uh, that for the time being it's going to be difficult. I don't assume that that will remain the case forever forever because not only are they a social force, but they have their own interest in being represented. They have their own interest in trying to influence what's going to happen in Egypt. And, and to what extent does it seem like there is um, understanding or willingness to bring them in? Do we think that that's um, something that the military, the current civilian um, folks in charge um, appreciate or um, are willing to support? I'll just, I, I, I'll just why, say that, why don't you respond and then Dr. Dunn? I'll just say that I, the words we're hearing are the right words. The question is whether the behaviors reflect the words. Dr. Dunn. Uh, Senator Shaheen, Egypt just went through a period from uh, December 2012 till now where there was a constitution passed and uh, laws and so forth and, and elections being prepared that a significant part of the body politic, in that case the secularists, felt excluded from, right. objected to, and it led to everything that we saw happen just now. Uh, so I think that if the Brotherhood, which is a very significant movement in Egypt, is excluded this time around, we're going to be headed for more of this. We're going to be headed for a cycle of instability. So uh, there's that. Regarding the sincerity of including the Brotherhood now, um, you know, I, I think the desire is to um, cut the Brotherhood down to size. Uh, 
through uh, arresting their leadership and, and so forth, and maybe to include them in some very uh, uh, disadvantaged condition. And, if, and they're not agreeing to that. Uh, of course. So uh, I, I think, you know, Ambassador Kurtzer mentioned earlier that there may be negotiations going on, whether among Egyptians or perhaps with some European mediation that could bring about some sort of agreement on this. Uh, but it's, it's going to be difficult. You know, it's very difficult for the Brotherhood to, to swallow this, that they elected this president and he's removed in this way. And unfortunately, the way he was removed allows them to escape from uh, how badly they failed in leadership. Senator, I, I would like to sharpen the point that, uh, that Dennis indicated on social cohesion as a problem, as a risk. I think the risk is actually much more severe uh, if in fact a, a national reconciliation can't take place. And what do I mean by that? The Brotherhood has a long history, 85 years, most of which living underground and operating outside the system, developing a very significant infrastructure uh, outside the purview of the state. Right now, today, they have adopted tactics that uh, confront, are confronting uh, the authorities. And they've decided that that's the best way to build the support back that they used to have. If they decide not to engage in a national reconciliation process that's real, in other words, if the process is real or the offer is real and they decide not to, they could also decide to engage in what we would call an insurgency. Mm -hmm. And they would have that capability, not just because of their underground uh, history, but also because this is a region where weapons are easy to come by and where uh, jihadists are easy to come by. Uh, they cross borders at will. So I don't want to sound alarmist, but this is not simply a question of uh, the lack of social cohesion. This could deteriorate, and it could deteriorate rapidly if A, the offer for reconciliation is not real, or B, if it's real and the Brotherhood says no to it. Mm. One of the things that got a lot of attention here at the outset of um, the revolution in Egypt was when the Morsi government proposed a law to require um, National Security Committee to approve all NGO activities. Um, obviously, people remembered the um, representatives from IRI and NDI who were jailed and how they were treated. And it seems to me as, as we think about how can we support um, countries like Egypt that one of the sectors that's really critical is the civil society sector. So do we have any sense of what this interim government is going to do with respect to NGOs and civil society leaders and is there more that we should be doing or could be doing to try and support those civil society leaders? Uh, the short answer, we don't know yet, but this is one of those areas that would be the best indication that they're for real about wanting to create a genuine political process that changes the, the future of Egypt, that, that creates in Egypt a representative, inclusive, tolerant society where there is genuine political space for real political pluralism. The key to that is going to be building civil society institutions, the willingness to embrace and rewrite the laws to pardon those who, uh, who were prosecuted and found guilty. I think that becomes a very significant measure of the direction of Egypt, and it should be a focal point of where we try to use our leverage. Dr. Ben? Uh, I agree with Ambassador Ross about that. Uh, I think the treatment of civil society, freedom for civil society, and for the media will be some of the leading you know, indicators of where things are going and that it's something we should press on. One thing we have to remember is that our our problem about this with civil society, and, and this is why the United States is not giving any civil society to Egypt, hasn't been for some time now because of the NGO case that you mentioned, Senator. This started under military rules, so it wasn't a problem under Morsi. It was a problem under both, both under the SCAF and under Morsi. So this is something that uh, one would hope could be corrected now. Thank you. Uh, Senator, having, having been the uh, harbinger of gloom on the previous question, let me be a little more optimistic here. If you look at the composition of this interim government, they're actually quite good people. Uh, graduates of the American University in Cairo, people who 
came up with a more liberal education. So yes, the, the past has been a real problem and it's been a very significant challenge for us. But I think there's something to build on because I think we may have a government in place that actually understands the importance of civil society. Thank you. Senator Flake. I'll yield my time to Senator McCain. Senator McCain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank so the that's witnesses. That's our Arizona collegi collegiality zone. <laughs> we, uh, not to take away from my time, but we believe in the early bird rule. <laughs> Uh, I guess it's not where you stand, it's where you sit, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Um, I thank the witnesses. Uh, I want to discuss for a minute the issue of aid. The one thing that the United States of America stands for is the rule of law. And we, uh, which clearly uh, Morsi ignored and perverted and uh, took uh, powers onto himself, which were not in keeping with, the own, with his own constitution. So we have a law, and that law states very clearly, without a national security waiver, as most laws that we pass do, that says a coup or a decree uh, will occasion an, a cutoff of aid to whatever country there is. So now I see my friends here say, well, uh, he was a bad guy. Well, the, uh, the people supported it uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, it was very popular to have this coup. And as Dr. Dunn pointed out, there were elections scheduled uh, uh, fairly soon. So we are now in a situation, much to my regret, where we are asking the new government to write a constitution, have laws, and, and, and respect and abide by those rules of law. But for purposes of um, practicality or whatever reason we might use, we are not going to cut off that aid. Uh, and I don't see a coherent policy. I note this morning towards Egypt, I note this morning we're not going to deliver F-16s. We're not cutting off aid, but we're not going to deliver F-16s. Um, I, d I don't see a coherent policy toward Egypt, and if I were those people in the street in Cairo, I, I, w I wouldn't understand it either. Uh, there's a risk of us enforcing our, ru our laws that we could alienate some people in Egypt who would think we're siding with the Muslim Brotherhood. We're now the, the uh, uh, new uh, president, or the General al Sisi has now called for demonstrations, demonstrations in the street to support what they are doing. And, against Morsi, and we see uh, violence uh, taking place um, in various parts of Egypt and threats of more. The one thing I think the Muslim Brotherhood knows how to do, and that's operate underground. They did it for many, many years, and they're pretty good at it. So my concern is, one, our, and it was a very tough call for, for me and Senator Graham to make the decision that we made. But I'm not sure how we, co how we ask another country to impose the rule of law and abide by it, and we don't for purposes that we think are uh, more important or whatever. Um, and by the way, I'm glad we're writing a new law, which does condition aid, I think, very appropriately, but the present law is on the books. So I guess um, my question to you, uh, Ambassador Ross, who I admire enormously, um, how, how do we reconcile that what do you think about the suspension of the F-16s? Do we have a policy, uh, a coherent policy that members of Congress and the American people and the Egyptian people can understand? I'd like to, maybe we could have those responses from all three witnesses. Look, Without the, objection. Uh, Madam President, am I in order to speak about the nomination of Tony West? The senator is in order. Okay. Today, the Senate will vote on the nomination of Tony West to be Associate Gen uh, Attorney General. Although I will be supporting Mr. West's nomination, I have some concerns about his record that I want to share with my colleagues. This is a very important position. The Associate Attorney General is the third highest ranking official within the Department of Justice. Mr. West is currently serving as Acting Associate Attorney General 
And as far as I can tell, so far, he has generally done a pretty good job. However, before serving as Acting Associate Attorney General, Mr. West was confirmed as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division. My concerns are that with his record while serving in that position, specifically while heading the Civil Division, Mr. West was involved in and even defended the quid pro quo deal between the Department of Justice and the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. That scheme was orchestrated by Tom Perez, who headed the Civil Rights Division and was recently confirmed by the Senate to be Labor Secretary. My colleagues have heard me on the floor of this body many times talking about this quid pro quo, most often emphasizing Tom Perez's involvement with it not too much about Mr. West. The quid pro quo involves the department agreeing to decline two false claims cases pending against the city of St. Paul. Remember, those uh, two false claims cases were estimated, if successful, and they were pretty good cases, to bring about $200 million back into the federal treasury. Now, in exchange for this quid pro quo, the city of St. Paul would agree to drop a case pending before the Supreme Court. As I've said, I've spoken at length on the St. Paul quid pro quo as it relates to the nomination of Mr. Perez to be Secretary of Labor. As my colleagues know, I've been a major supporter of whistleblowers and their protection under the laws of this country. Because whistleblowers are a very important source of information, knowing if laws are not being abided by or money is being misspent. And of course, that's why I authored the 1986 amendments to the False Claims Act to protect whistleblowers, but also giving a source, a resource for getting money back into the federal treasury if it's misspent. Those amendments, meaning the False Claims Act amendments, revitalize the law by empowering individual key TAM whistleblowers to come forward and to file suits on behalf of the federal government to recover taxpayer dollars lost to fraud. Since those amendments were enacted, over $40 billion has been recovered. And under Mr. West's tenure as head of the Civil Division, that department has been successfully utilizing the tools of key TAM whistleblowers' information. And of course, they aren't shy about saying so. As far as I'm concerned, that's their right to do it. And the more publicity we can do of recovering money out of the False Claims Act, the more we may encourage more whistleblowers to come forth and recover even more money. The False Claims Act is within the purview of the Civil Division. Now, Mr. West oversaw that division at this time, not the Civil Rights Division. However, in the quid pro quo, the evidence uncovered by my investigation suggests that Mr. West allowed Tom Perez to take control of the Civil Division in order to cut this deal that saved Mr. Perez's favored legal theory, referred to as a desperate impact theory. As I've discussed previously, Mr. Perez was concerned that the Supreme Court was going to strike down this theory as unconstitutional. In doing so, the Department undercut a viable, a viable case against St. Paul and in the process left the whistleblower who filed the suit to fight the city on behalf of the American taxpayers all alone. Left him out there twisting in the wind. And this is not how I expect the department to treat good faith whistleblowers. They're patriotic people. They're people that probably destroy their, op their opportunity 
of livelihood because they know something's wrong and they want to report it, just like patriotic people ought to do. In fact, I believe it is contrary to the assurances that Mr. West gave me during his confirmation hearing in 2009 when he indicated he would protect whistleblowers and vigorously enforce the False Claims Act. Because let nobody, let everybody understand that there's not a single individual subject to Senate confirmation in the Justice Department that comes before my uh, comes before the committee or to my office for interview that I don't ask them their view of the False Claims Act because I don't want somebody in the Justice Department that doesn't want vigorous enforcement and use of the False Claims Act. As I've said, ultimately Mr. Perez was the architect of this ill-advised quid pro quo that left Frederick Newell, the good faith whistleblower, hanging out there to dry. In my view, Mr. Perez bears the most responsibility in this whole matter. He was the one who was manipulating the process, and he did so at times behind Mr. West's back. Nonetheless, Mr. West was the individual in charge of the Civil Division, and as head of that division, the decision regarding whether or not to join those false claims ca cases fell to Mr. West. It is troubling to me that Mr. Perez, who at the time was head of the Civil Rights Division, would be the one who was so clearly orchestrating the deal and acting as de facto head of Civil Division, and of course, Mr. West let him get away with it. So that concerns me as it relates to Mr. West's nomination to be the third highest ranking official at the Department of Justice. We need individuals serving in these positions who are willing to stand up to those who are saying in it, who are trying to advance a political agenda, and that's exactly what Mr. Perez was trying to advance. And in this instance, at least, it doesn't appear that Mr. West stood up to Mr. Perez as he should have. On the contrary, the record appears to indicate Mr. West allowed Mr. Perez to orchestrate this deal on behalf of the Civil Division, even though Mr. Perez was head of the Civil Rights Division. However, notwithstanding these concerns, I'm willing to give Mr. West the benefit of the doubt and vote for his nomination. Part of the reason I'm willing to do so is because the Civil Division, under Mr. West's leadership, has established a respectable record in utilizing the tools available under the False Claims Act amendments that I got passed in 1986 and that have brought back into the Treasury just under $40 billion. And as an instance of Mr. West's use of the False Claims Act, the Civil Division uh, secured approximately four nine-tenths billion dollars coming back in the Federal Treasury just in the year one year of 2012. And taken together over the last several years, the Civil Division has secured a total of approximately 13 and 3 tenths billion dollars. Obviously, this is not an insignificant amount of coming back of taxpayers' dollars. And although the Department's recovery of this money, on the one hand, does not excuse their behavior in the quid pro quo matter, I do believe Mr. West deserves a certain degree of credit for his leadership in this area. So as I said, I will support the nomination. I expect that he'll be confirmed. It's my sincere hope that he will perform his job well and not let somebody undercut him as he let Mr. Prez undercut him in regard to the quid pro quo and the false claims cases involving St. Paul, Minnesota. But I want him to know and everybody else to know that I plan to conduct aggressive oversight of the department to ensure that the mistakes that were occurred as part of the quid pro quo that potentially cost the taxpayers nearly $200 million lost to fraud are not repeated. I yield the floor. I suggest the absence of a court. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
uh, you know, are just happy to see their rivals decimated however it happens, you know, uh, and, and uh, hope to reap, reap political advantage during the next elections because of that. As Senator, we, we've been lamenting during this hearing uh, the absence of civil society. I would say just the opposite. What we've seen for two years is the face of Egyptian civil society, and it's very exciting. You have millions of people ready to participate in politics and to try to effect change. Now, as we all know, they don't have a positive agenda yet. They're not well organized. They're not quite uh, coherent with respect to what they want proactively. But the raw material for building that civil society uh, is now manifest. We now know what it looks like. I would also add that even within the Muslim Brotherhood, there is more pluralism than uh, is suggested in what we see in the press. When you read Muslim Brotherhood websites, there is a debate going on between the older generation and the younger generation, between those who want to open up the movement more and those who want to keep it the way it was. So there's a lot of these things going on in this laboratory of change, which makes this a very exciting time in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Paul. I want to thank the panel for coming today and expressing your opinions. Uh, I would like to know uh, a fairly direct response, though, whether or not you think the military takeover in Egypt was a coup or not a coup. By a, a, a legal definition, I would say it's pretty hard to say that it's not a coup. Okay. Uh, yes, Senator, I believe it was a coup. It had a lot of popular support, but that is often the case with military coups. That, that's not unique to this case. Well, just so we have one point of difference, I would uh, hesitate to call it a coup because the military has not taken power. They continue to stand behind the seat of power, but they have uh, made it clear through the roadmap that they issued and then their actions since then that they want to see the restoration of a civilian government. Well, the reason this is important is because our law says that when a coup occurs, you know, the aid ends. So we can debate whether it's a good idea to end, and you're welcome to have opinions on whether it's a good idea to have aid or not to have aid, but the law is the law. And if we decide that we're above the law, it's very hard for us to be preaching to the rest of the world about having the rule of law. So I think this seriously undermines our standing in the world, and it seriously goes against anyone who claims that they're for the rule of law. But I would go one step further, even if you say this is not a coup because a military is not there's not a general currently running it. I think that's, uh, you know, semantics and really not going to the point of this because our law says basically if the military had a substantial involvement in replacing a democratically elected government, so it doesn't matter according to our law whether there's a general in charge or not, but putting a, a president who's been elected under house arrest, putting, we don't know where some of these people are, I mean, this is the definition of the kind of thing that we're supposedly opposed to. And I was no great fan of the Muslim Brotherhood. I wasn't for aiding the Muslim Brotherhood either. But the thing is, is if we're not going to obey the law, if we're simply going to say that we bring a panel before us that says aid's a good idea, realize that if you're telling us that the aid should continue, you're telling us to flout the law. You're telling us that the law is not important and that basically the, we can decide the, the benefits or the detriments of whether or not to continue aid are more important than the law. And to my mind, you can't, if you are, you're rising to a level where you say you're above everything what we stand for. If the president's not going to adhere to the rule of law, if he's going to say that he creates the law, we so damage our standing in the world, we so damage what we stand for that we have no moral basis for going around the world or telling anybody anything. There's a huge argument we can have about whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. I personally think that if we think we're buying the goodwill of the Egyptian people, when they're being doused with tear gas that was made in Pennsylvania, paid for with U.S. taxpayer dollars, I don't think they're jumping up and down and saying, yay, America. So I would say that I think that foreign aid has often gone to criminals. 
It's often gone to plutocrats. It's often gone to dictators. It's often gone into the pockets of one plutocrat who then goes and fills up a Louis Vuitton bag full of cash and goes and spends it in Paris. And it's, it's obscene. And I think for us to, to be defending aid to Egypt when we've given $60 billion of it to the Mubarak family who were basically thieves and stole it and used it for their own personal aggrandizement. You look at Mobutu and his family. You look at the history of foreign aid. You look at the history of thievery and thuggery and people who have taken the money and used it for their own personal benefit. And then we're going to come here and say one versus the other. I truly fear that even out of the military establishment, which everybody says is so much more pro-Western, that what we're going to get out of the military establishment or what we could get is someone who rises up and becomes a strong man and says, I'll correct this chaos in Egypt and I'll do it, but I'll do it through the strength of being a general that'll do whatever I want. And maybe whatever I want means reclaiming lands that we say Israel's taken from us or that maybe someday our weapons are used. But I think it's absolutely chaos over there to be sending planes and tanks into this chaos. But above and beyond all the debate really is, are we going to obey the law? I don't think really... Other than some objections, there are serious people out there saying this is not a coup. To define this is not a coup is not to have an intelligent debate in my, from my point of view. But I, I would, would love to see or hear if there is a justification for breaking the law. Because if this is a coup and you want to continue aid, you're basically arguing for breaking the law. Uh, Senator, uh, since I was the... Uh, uh uh, one who uh, refused to call it a coup. Let me uh, take the first crack at responding. And I would respond to two points you made. Uh, first, on the question of, of foreign aid, which is a different issue from what we're talking about. Um, uh, perhaps this requires a longer discussion, but I think we can be proud of the uh, billions of dollars of aid that we provided to Egypt, both military and economic. We helped uh, build a country that was uh, largely broken. Including what Mubarak stole? Uh, I, I think it has yet to be determined that Mubarak stole our money. And how would you respond to the fact that Al Sisi, who is from the military, is the. I'd ask that all time be yield back. Is there objection? Without objection. I'd ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayat, Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baggage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Inzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, 
Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp, Mr. Heller, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Resch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative, Baldwin, Brown, Cantwell, Collins, Corker, Gillibrand, Heitkamp, King, Lee, Murray, Tester, and Warren. No senator voted in the negative. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, aye.
Mr. Paul. Yes. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Isaacson. Aye. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chambliss. Aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Vitter, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Coates, Mr. Coates, aye. Mr. C Carden, Mr. Carden, aye. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, aye. Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Heller, Mr. Heller, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Chiesa, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Thune, 
Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Cochran. Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane, aye. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye. Mr. Johans, Mr. Johans, aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Sessions, Mr. Sessions, aye. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Donnelly, aye. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono, aye. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Kirk. Mr. Kirk, no. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, aye. Ms. Landrew. Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Inhoff, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, aye.
Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Kirk, aye.